نعوذ ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله تبارك وتعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وأحسن الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار نسأل الله العزيز الغفار أن يجيرنا وإياكم من عذاب النار أما بعد أيها الأخيار لقد ذكر الله تبارك وتعالى المال في كتابه الكريم وذكر أنه متاع وأنه زينة الحياة الدنيا وسماه تبارك وتعالى خيرا في كتابه قال الله تبارك وتعالى وإنه لحب الخير لشديد أي لحب المال لشديد وجعله الله تبارك وتعالى قواما للأنفس وأمر بحفظه وعدم تبذيره ومدح النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ما الحلال الطيب منه بقوله نعم المال الصالح للمرء المرء الصالح في روايه الرجل الصالح وجعله الله سببا لحفظ البدن وجعل حفظه سببا لحفظ النفس التي هي محل معرفة الله عز وجل ومحل الإيمان به وتصديق رسله وإنما يذم منه ما استخرج من غير وجهه وصرف في غير حقه واستعبد صاحبه وملك قلبه وشغله عن الله وعن الدار الآخرة فالذم للجاعل لا للمجعول فقد أخرج البخاري عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم تعس عبد الدينار تعس عبد الدرهم تعس عبد الخميصة إن أعطي رضي وإن لم يعطى سخر تعس وانتكس وإذا شيك لن تقش وهذا دعاء من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عليه إذا دخلت الشوكة في يده أو في رجله فهو قد دعا الله تبارك وتعالى ألا تخرج منه عافانا الله وإياكم ثم قال صلى الله عليه وسلم طوبى لعبد آخذ بعنان فرسه في سبيل الله أشعث أغبى وفي رواية أشعث رأسه مخبرة قدماه إن كان في الحراسة كان في الحراسة وإن كان في الساقة كان في الساقة إن استأذن لم يؤذن له وإن شفع لم يشفع إخوة الإسلام إن حب المال غريزة غريزة في النفس البشرية وجبلة في الطبيعة الإنسانية وليس الإثم والعتم في حب المال إنما الإثم 
يقوم على أمور منها سوء جمع المال وسوء إنفاقه وتعلق القلب به وإيثاره على دين الله ومن أكبر المصائب أن يجنح المال بصاحبه حتى يدفعه إلى هاوية الجحود ونكران النعم يدفعه للتكبر والعتو والتعالي على الخلق والخالق كما حدث مع صاحب الجنتين إخوة الإسلام لقد ذكر أهل العلم لقصة صاحب الجنتين في سورة الكهف أكثر من ستين فائدة وفي الخطبة الثامنة هذه في قصة أو في قصص سورة الكهف سنستعرض اليوم إن شاء الله تعالى بعض هذه الفوائد عسى ربنا أن ينفعنا بها إنه ولي ذلك والقادر عليه Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it so that wealth is one of the pillars of the life of this world. He subhanahu wa ta'ala also made it its availability or lack thereof a test for the son of Adam. And many all throughout history have made it through the test of poverty, but only a few have succeeded in the test of abundance of wealth. As the abundance can easily misguide the son of Adam and lead him to arrogance and to a fake sense of self-sufficiency and the feeling that he does not need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anymore and thus he turns his back on the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قال الله عز وجل الهاكم التكافو حتى زرتم المقابر Abundance deludes you until you visit the graves. Once you find yourself in the grave, then you understand. You realize that the abundance that you had means nothing. قال الله عز وجل إن الإنسان ليطغى أرآه استغنى In fact, Allah in fact, the human being oversteps his boundaries because he considers himself exempt or he considers himself self-sufficient. He does not need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, the scholars of Islam have counted more than 60 benefits from the story of the man with the two gardens. And this is khutbah number eight in the subject in speaking about the stories of Surah Al-Kahf. We will spend a few minutes, inshallah ta'ala, and have to go, we'll go through a few of those benefits as much as we can, inshallah ta'ala, providing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will benefit us and teach us what we need to learn when it comes to our, our deen. Number one, the fact that so many lessons can be derived from such a small story with few verses in the Qur'an, it shows you the depth of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then with a little contemplation by the scholars of Al-Islam, a lot of knowledge can be extracted, a lot of guidance can be taken uh, from just a small number of ayat. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he introduced the, the story, make an example for them the, of the two men, uh, to one we gave two gardens with grapevines and surrounded with palm dates and putting between them some cultivated land. The ayah that we heard in the last few khutab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qala wadrib lahum man hum and who are they? Make an example for them. And the example is for Quraysh. As Surah Al-Kahf was revealed in Mecca. As Surah Mecca. Uh, subhanallah. This an example was for Quraysh. And although it was, it was an example put forward for the proud Quraysh who were arrogant towards the weak and the poor, and subhanAllah, in order to admonish them, believers uh, in general should use the story, put it forward in similar situation to utilize the stories, lesson in the, the da'wah to Allah, the call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لذلك قال أهل العلم ليست ليست العبرة بخصوص السبب ولكن العبرة بعموم اللفظ. The benefit is not from 
the specificity of the reason, meaning the reason why it was revealed, but the lesson is in the generality of the, the term. The term uh, can be applied for uh, any similar situation. Number three, the priorities of the disbelievers, uh, as we see from the story, are often misguided. Allah Azza wa Jalla فَقَالَ لِصَاحِبِهِ وَهُوَ يُحَاوِرُهُ أَنَا أَكْثَرُ مِنْكَ مَالًا وَأَعَزُّ نَثَرًا قَالَ قَتَالًا وَتِلْكَ وَاللَّهِ أُمْنِيَةُ الْفَاجِرِ وَتِلْكَ وَاللَّهِ أُمْنِيَةُ الْفَاجِرِ كَثْرَةُ الْمَالِ وَعِزَّةُ النَّفَرِ سبحان الله when Allah Ta'ala mentioned and I have more when he was debating with his companion and he said I have more wealth and I have more people under me Qatada said this by Allah is the wish, the wish of the immoral to have a lot of wealth and a large entourage. SubhanAllah. As the, 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 this is the wish of the immoral, but the wish of the true believer is completely different. Number four, the disbelieving societies, they evaluate uh, matters in terms of wealth and power. That's the measure. هذا هو المقياس عندهم سبحان الله قريش were no different the tribe of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم when they realized that Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم was sent to them as a prophet <laughs> سبحان الله why why didn't Allah send somebody else with more power and more influence in his tribe وقالوا لولا نزل هذا القرآن على رجل من القريتين عظيم أي من مكة أو الطائف فجاب الله عز وجل أهم يقسمون رحمة ربك نحن قسمنا بينهم معيشتهم في الحياة الدنيا ورفعنا بعضهم فوق بعض الدرجات ليتخذ بعضهم بعضا سخريا ورحمة ربك خير مما يجمعون People when Quraysh said well why didn't Allah give this revelation to someone who is more prominent someone who has more wealth and power from, from the two from the two towns in the Mecca or Taif, the two main towns in Arabia. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers this. Is, uh, are they the ones that allocate the mercy of your Lord? We have allocated for them their livelihood among them in this life. And we elevated some of them above others in rank. So that they, some of them may employ others in service. But your Lord's mercy is better than what they accumulate. Number five, the disbelievers' religious choices are often affected by the material wealth and power of those who call them to the deen of Allah. As someone who's making, calling them to Allah, they look at their situation. Let's see, is he wealthy? What's his social status? What's his lineage? Okay, then, then based on that, we're going to determine, subhanAllah. And they often belittle the ones that are giving them da'wah uh, that are not as prominent as them and as themselves they give them no importance as the owner owner of the two gardens made a statement i have more than more more wealth than you and more numbers as in you are who are you to tell me anything i am better than you i am superior than you you are poor and you're smaller in number do you think i will listen to you the people of Nuh, Noah, alayhi salam, said something very similar. قال الله عز وجل عن قوم نوح فقال الملأ الذين كفروا من قومه ما نراك إلا بشرا مثلنا وما نرى وما نراك تبع تبعك إلا الذين هم أراذلنا بادي الرأي وما نراكم نرى نرى لكم علينا من فضل بل نظنكم كاذبين. The notables, the chiefs from the people of Nuh السلام, huh? The notables among the ones that disbelieved as Allah said we, They said we see you as nothing but a human being like us Hey Nuh, Noah, you, who do you think you are? just a human being You think you're gonna we're going to listen to you? Huh? You're just humans like us And we see that only the lowliest among us have followed you Those of immature judgment and we see that you have no advantage over us. In fact, we think that you, all of you, are liars. SubhanAllah. 
Number six, the superiority of wealth caused the disbeliever to become not only arrogant towards his counterpart, the believer that was given in da'wah, but also to become uh, arrogant and heedless towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, uh, he entered his garden and he's wrong, but while wrong, while oppressing himself, as Allah Ta'ala said, He's entered his garden, he said, I while being unjust to himself, he said, oh, this, I don't think that this garden will ever disappear or perish. And I do not think that the hour, uh, the day of judgment, I don't think that will happen either. SubhanAllah. And number seven, the, and these are connected, the ones, the, the, the sins, the people that wrong themselves by sins and transgressions, they, subhanAllah, they're in essence not harming anyone. The very first victim of their behavior is themselves. As they, as that's why Allah Ta'ala says, uh, they, they wrong themselves. ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ قال الله عز وجل ثم أوردنا الكتاب الذين اصطفينا من عبادنا فمنهم ظالم لنفسه ذكرها هي الأولى إن أغلب الناس ظالم لنفسه فمنهم ظالم لنفسه ومنهم مقتصد ومنهم سابق بالخيرات بإذن الله ذلك هو الفضل الكبير الله تعالى says then we uh, pass the book to those who of our servants whom we selected some of them wrong themselves, wrong their souls. And some follow the middle course and some of them are foremost in good deeds by Allah's lead. That is the greatest favor. The ones that truly take this, the, the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to heart and follow it, huh? then they're, no, they're the ones who will succeed and that's by Allah's favor subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number eight, thinking that the garden will never perish shows the disbelievers lack of understanding one that subhanallah that on the day of judgment their their lack of intelligence will become appear apparent to even them they will realize how subhanallah dumb they were only on the day of judgment how do we know that from the quran subhanallah it said, had, had we, had we, if we were people that actually listened or understood anything, we would not be from the dwellers of the blazing fire. If we had any kind of understanding, any kind of intelligence, we would have saved ourselves from the blazing fire. Number nine, some believe that their property is, uh, and their, their wealth is a fruit of their own intellect and subhanAllah intelligence and, and skill set and all of the above and subhanAllah and by doing so, by saying so, by thinking so they do nothing but imitate a famous one that Allah mentioned in the Quran huh? and all of you know who he is Qarun Allah Azza wa Jalla innama utituhu ala ilmin indi أولم يعلم أن الله قد أهلك من قبله من القرون من هو أشد منه قوة وأكثر جمعا ولا يسأل عن ذنوبهم المجرمون. He said, in قارون, I was able to obtain all this wealth, all this property, all these things, and because of the knowledge that I have, because of the intelligence that I have, because of the skills that I have. Did he not know, Allah responds, that Allah has destroyed generations before him who were even stronger than him and possessed greater riches? But the guilty will not be asked about their sins. What does that statement mean? These type of, pe type of people like Qarun, for example, there is no reason for, for him to stand for his hisab for accountability. These are the pe people that have a that has a direct ticket to Jahannam, there's no, there's no layover, there's no stopping, and straight, subhanAllah, Allah will not ask them, what's the point? Because they, they died upon other than the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how many are those who are heedless about Allah's Lordship 
and who will leave that their possessions and their success in the matters of life of this world are as a fruit of their efforts and their, their ability and this subhanallah and uh, this was going to be my next point but subhanallah this is the this is this is yani, a disbelief in the tawheed of lordship you take away from Allah something that belongs to him subhanahu wa ta'ala he is the bestower you say no no I'm the bestower I bestow this upon myself may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the ones that establish all the facets of the tawheed the tawheed of deity the tawheed of lordship and the tawheed of names and attributes أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو البر الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه Brothers and sisters We live in a time where the majority of the suffering on the face of the earth today is of Muslim nature. And the issue has become so rampant and so widespread that it has become the norm and Muslims themselves don't even pay attention to it anymore. Brothers and sisters, we have to know that there is a rule in Islamic fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, that any area of the world that used to be a land of Islam in the past will always remain in the eyes of Allah a land of Islam until the day of judgment. But nowadays, unfortunately, it looks like instead of areas coming back to Islam, more and more are being lost every day while the Muslims are heedless, running after the life of this world and not thinking about their afterlife. Brothers and sisters, since roughly the 8th century of Islam. The area of Kashmir has been predominantly Muslim. Uh, it's a, a Muslim land ruled by Muslim rulers. And after many ups and downs ever since, all throughout history, as this area went through many trials and tribulations, and in 1947 the, it has become a subject of dispute between many uh, countries namely India and China and Great Britain and others but nowadays unfortunately the same system that was used successfully in Spain and Andalus and it, has, it, has, it is being used in Palestine and that the Russians tried to use in many of their neighboring areas such as Bukhara the land of Imam al-Bukhari subhanallah uh, the great scholar of Islam, the great scholar of, that compiled the most correct book of hadith that has ever, ever been written uh, and many other great scholars. The very same method is being used in Kashmir today. The textbook method used throughout history in order to, er to eradicate Islam from an area of the world by making life difficult, impossible for the local Muslims, torturing them, even killing them, exposing them to every conceivable type of harm even prevented them from any type of worship or religious rituals or compelling them or trying to compel them to to leave the area so that non-Muslims will take their place it is history repeating itself a methodical replacement of the local population it might surprise you that the ones that are doing this actually sent their experts to Spain in order to study the Spanish Inquisition Mahakim al-Taftish with the clear intention to duplicate the same methods used to change Spain from a Muslim area of the world for eight centuries to an area and this is an area by the way that produced some of the greatest scholars of Islam like Ibn al-Arabi, Ibn al-Hazm, Ibn al-Qurqubi, Imam al-Shatibi and many many others changing it into an area uh, with Muslims being the minority they and the minority that they actually had to hide their identity so that they're not killed hence the name the Morisks what is a Morisk? a Morisk is a term used 
for uh, a Muslim in Spain that claimed to be a Christian in order to avoid tortured or being killed. SubhanAllah. What happened to the Moors? Well, a few centuries later, today their descendants are completely integrated into the Catholic or atheist Spanish society. And Islam is long gone. All we could recognize from them is their facial features. They clearly look from Arab descent as the genes don't lie. Or what is remnant of their Arabic ancestors names that have been Latinized beyond recognition. Such as what happened with the majority of the cities in Spain. You have Malqa, now it's now Malaga. You have Baladul Walid, now it's Bayadulid. You have Ramnata, it's now Granada, and so on and so forth. So many, a whole list, subhanAllah. It would also shock you to know that some of these four former Moorists that I spoke about were actually descendants of the Prophet Now imagine people that are from the lineage of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whole generations, whole families that are now non-Muslims living in Spain. The same thing is being done in Kashmir as we speak. But the only the means have changed. The technology has changed, meaning that it's being done with a level of brutality that is unprecedented. Brothers and sisters, one of you might ask, well, what, what can we do? And the answer, and this is, I'll give you three, three answers, three options, and Allah knows what others, and there are many uh, things that, that can be done. But the answer will take effort from the whole ummah, because this is part of our ummah. Number one, the first thing, and this is the first rule, it's a general rule, all of us going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fixing our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Becoming better Muslims. قال الله عز وجل يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن تنصروا الله ينصركم ويثبت أقدامكم O you who believe, if you stand up for Allah, He subhanahu wa ta'ala will support you and He will strengthen your foothold. Number two. Any kind of aid that we can give our brothers and sisters all through the, the legal channels, we should not hesitate. Prophet said, the believers are like one person. If his head aches, the whole body aches with fever and sleeplessness. Number three, let's not be stingy with our brothers and sisters when it comes to du'a. Wouldn't you want the whole community, for example, to make du'a for you if, if you were in hardship? I know that you would. Well, our brothers are going through every type of hardship you can think of right now. They're being tested in their health, in their wealth, in their families, even in their honor. And most importantly, they are being tested in their deen. And so many of them are at risk of losing their deen, just like the Moorists from Spain. They, for them, Islam is a long, they don't even know what that is. SubhanAllah. So the worst thing we can do is to forget our brothers and sisters and forget about them. But SubhanAllah, as you know, one of the clear conditions of the dua being accepted is the first point that I mentioned going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fixing our relationship with Allah so that our supplication will be accepted so let us make dua for them as much as we can in all the times and for dua provided that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive our shortcomings towards them may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist them in their hardship may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect their honors and their deen may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them a way out of their calamity. Ameen, ameen, ameen. I call the holy hada, and I'll stop for Allah. Allahumma fill lana dhunubana, wa yisrafana fi amrina, 
وثبت اقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين اللهم اجعل الحياة زيادة لنا في كل خير واجعل الموت راحة لنا من كل شر اللهم آتي أنفسنا تقواها وزكها أنت خير من زكاها أنت وليها ومولاها اللهم اغفر لنا خطأنا وعمدنا وجدنا وهزلنا وكل ذلك عندنا عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون وآخر الصلاة